to the Immutable and Reproducible track, and thank you for coming to the last talk on a Sunday. Uh, we are joined by David Kavalka, a Fedora contributor, uh, talking about making Fedora Linux more reproducible. Please take it away, David. Hello, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm David. I'm a production engineer at Meta by day, but this is mostly about work we've been doing in Fedora. Um, the work I'm presenting in this talk is work that was primarily done by another Fedora contributor, Zbyshek, who is not here. So the credit for all of this awesome work goes to him. I'm just here to tell you about it. So we'll start with a quick intro about what reproducible builds are in general and why we should care about reproducible builds. We'll then talk about reproducible builds in Fedora and what makes Fedora different on the, in this area. We'll give a few examples of why sometimes this is hard and when things can go wrong, and we'll close with where we are and where we're going. So let's get started. Uh, this is the definition of what reproducible builds is officially. If you go on reproducibleBuilds.org and it says a build is reproducible, if you give them the same source code, build environment, and build instruction, anybody can recreate bit by bit identical, identical copies of everything. So if you start from the same things and you do the same process, you get the same output. And you can have different parties doing this. Why would you care? Um, there's a few angles to this, and I think they mostly, one angle is a security angle, and the other is a quality angle. And different people care about different things in this avenue. Uh, personally, I care primarily about the quality angle, that if you have the ability to reproduce builds and to tell immediately when something went wrong, because you get a different result, that makes it really easy to spot certain classes of issues. If you have a builder with better M, for example, or if you have cosmic rays or whatever, that's causing intermittent failure, it becomes immediately obvious. It also becomes obvious if you have a situation where, well, maybe you have packages that are meant to be architecture independent, but are not really architecture independent because somebody's not in a conditional or is checking or is installing files in the wrong place. This come up right away. And these are like real bugs that would impact real users, but you might not find out because maybe one package in 10 is impacted. Uh, you can also find actual bugs in software. You'll find software that uses sources of randomness they weren't meant to use. You find, sometimes you'll find packages that will um, use uh, memory serialization features that are extremely brittle that you may want to fix. Uh, and on the security side, of course, if you can reproduce all of the builds and third parties can reproduce all of the builds, then you can verify that the builds you're getting from your supplier are actually good. Uh, so if you, depending on what your threat model are, uh, what the threat model is and what your interests are, you may want to do this on a case-by-case -case basis, or you may want to have a full rebuild of the entire distribution, or you may want to just trust that other people are doing this and ensuring that the supply chain is in good shape. Uh, and this also helps defending against like the trust in trust class of problems, where if somebody nicks a backdoor in a component very early into the stack, it can become extremely difficult to find out that it's happened, because if you're initial, if you're bootstrapping from low in the stack and the low part is compromised, everything is compromised, but you won't be able to tell. And with reproducible builds, this again becomes immediately obvious. So the reproducibleBuilds.org effort, which is kind of the reference um, effort around reproducible builds, was started in 2013 within Debian, within the Debian distribution. Um, and this encompassed both just building packages and checking that were reproducible, but also building a lot of tooling around this. And thanks to this effort, by 2017, they had the vast majority of distribution that was reproducible. And today, basically everything reproduces. It's like the number is greater than 98%. And if you look on the dashboard, there's nice dashboards that you can check. Um, pretty much every package is either earmarked and you know why it doesn't reproduce or it's fine. And this isn't just Debian now. A lot of other distributions embrace this process. Um, Arch Linux is there. But also, say, if you use F-Droid to install Android apps on your phone, F-Droid also uses the same process for the APKs. Um, and there's a few things to reproducible builds, but a lot, of it, a lot of the work you end up doing is similar across these environments. Because generally speaking, what you're talking about is that you take build artifacts that come out of your official build system, you do builds locally by whatever process, and you match them. And if they match, they're good. If they don't match, something is wrong, and you need to fix it. So uh, ish. There's things that make this interesting that we'll talk about in a bit. Um, and if you do this automatically, if you do this as part of your CI, then at some point you can have it as part of your, mm, like packagers in your distribution can get signal on whether the change they introduce makes their package not reproducible. Uh, two tools I wanted to call out that reproducibleblitz.org made that are extremely useful. The first one is Diffoscope, 
If you haven't used Diffoscope, you can go on try.diffoscope.org and play with it immediately. What Diffoscope does is that you feed it two, two binaries, and it figures out why they differ and how, and it figures it out in an intelligent way. So say you give it two RPMs. RPMs are CPIO archives, so it unpacks them. But then inside, you might have, I don't know, jar files, for example, if it's a Java app. So it unpacks those and then compares them in a useful way. Because a lot of these archival formats, they may not be, like, they, they may have differences that aren't meaningful because, for example, the tool to make them might introduce some kind of randomness. So this tool makes it really easy to tell what are the differences that matter that you need to fix. Uh, the other tool that came out of the Debian ecosystem is Strip Non-Determinism, which is a post-processor that you can use as part of your build toolchain. So, for example, if you, um, if you make static, um, static library, like .a libraries, those generally have some parts, some sections that aren't deterministic. Uh, if you have uh, um, Python compiled files like .py, .pyc, those are um, symbolically identical, but they, they're not bit by bit identical between architectures. So those are examples where a tool like this can help. Uh, and again, you can look this up on repositorybuilds.org. So now let's talk about Fedora. Um, now, I, I mentioned Debian earlier, and uh, one thing that is important to be aware of, especially when this project started in Debian, uh, in Debian, the way you made packages in Debian is that packages would upload the source, uh, a, a package they built on their machine to the archive, and then it would be rebuilt on, on the CI for the archive architectures. But it was a package that somebody built on their machine, and it wouldn't necessarily come from source control. This isn't the case anymore, is my understanding. Now I think everything comes from source control, but that's how it was. Uh, on Fedora, things have always come from source control. So we had what we call diskit, which is a set of Git repositories on sourcefedora.org, fedoraproject.org, where for every package there's a Git repo. The Git repo has the, the build manifest of the package, what we call the spec file in the RPM world. It has the patches that get applied. It has every, uh, like, every non-binary file that is applied that is part of the packaging process. And then it has uh, hashes of the sources. And then the sources are stored in a blob storage called the look aside on the other side. So if you take this kit plus the look aside, those are all the inputs. And then you have an extra input, which is how the build system is configured. The build system is called Koji. Uh, and what Koji does is that it takes these packages from this kit and builds them. Um, and on Koji, you can submit builds from local stuff, but they cannot be released builds. They're throwaway builds that you use for testing. If you're doing release builds, they always have to come uh, from this git. And then the artifacts that the distribution is made of, so like the, the ISO you download for Fedora, it has to come from Koji. You can't build it on like some random machine and then publish it. So the flow is that things go from this git, this git goes through Koji, Koji produces source RPMs, um, and then from the source RPMs we get binary RPMs. Now, at this point we have these packages, but they're not signed. And you want packages to be signed so you can tell they come from where they're supposed to come from and that they haven't been tampered with. So Koji also does the signing. Now, signing is where things start getting a bit interesting for reproducibility. The way the RPM format works is RPM is a fancy CPIO archive. And if you're not familiar with CPIO, it's like tar, but different. It's another one of these things from like the 70s. So, um, so it's like a tarball of all your files that go in the package and then a header with some metadata. The header contains these things called tags. And the tags can be things like the name of the package, the version of the package, the release of the package, who made the package, uh, the architecture. But it's also things like, you can see in this table, like the PGP signature of the header itself, the size of the header, the size of the payload, the SHA-1 checksum, uh, and then like the actual signature of the pay, either plus payload, which is the package signature. Now, these things obviously are not reproducible because if you're familiar with PGP or GPG, it's a public-private key system. If you don't have the private key, you, you can't remake the signatures. Uh, if, you, if you had the private key, the signature wouldn't be very useful because anybody could just spoof the packages. Uh, so this is kind of a problem. You can't just strip this out. Um, well, you can just replace this because you don't have the private key. Also, while this isn't a problem right now, uh, there are a number of signing algorithms that will be coming widespread use in the coming years, most likely, that have randomness as part of the signing process. So it is by design impossible to have identical signature. If you start from the same key, you sign the same uh, content, you get different bit by bit different signatures. So there's, there's no way there. 
Um, now, there's a few ways you can approach this problem. The way Debian approaches this problem, because Debian has similar constraints, is by using what's called detached signatures, where the signatures can be separated from the package um, in a way that, that makes it possible to move them around. Uh, this is not a thing we can do in RPM for a variety of reasons that are too boring to explain in detail here, but you can read the discussion if you're interested. Um, so if we go back to the definition, what we decided we would do in Fedora is something slightly different, where instead of st uh, starting with build environment and build instruction and having bit by bit identical copies of everything, we say that we start from build environment, build instruction, and metadata from the build artifacts. And then we get copies of the artifacts that are identical, except for signatures and parts of metadata. Um, our belief is that this provides the most use for the consumers of these, while still giving some value and not putting an undue burden on everyone that wants to do this. Now, the way you practically do this is that when you're comparing packages, you want to ignore some tags. Like, you know the signature is not going to match. The signature is unparticularly interesting when we're talking about reproducibility. We'll just strip it. And there's a few other tags that have similar issues that I'll talk about in a bit. So what we do is that we use this tool called RPM diff that comes from the RPM package suite. It comes from RPM lint. Uh, RPM lint is a tool you can feed it your RPM and it tells you all the things you did wrong when you made it. And uh, RPM diff, it takes you packages and it tells you how they differ in interesting ways. So it will ignore signatures and it has a bunch of tunables so you can tell it exactly what you care about. And then if they match, great. If they don't match, then we, we take Diffoscope and we feed this to Diffoscope and use Diffoscope to figure out, okay, what is specifically the problem here? What do we need to fix? Um, and that's the approach we've been using so far and it has worked, it has worked fairly well for us. Now, let's talk about a few situations where things get a bit interesting. So I talk about tags. Uh, signature isn't the only one. RPM has a bunch of other tags that aren't reproducible. Like, there's a tag that records the name, the host name of the ho machine where the package was built on. There's another that records a timestamp. And there's another that records the compiler flags that were exactly used when building. And finally, there's one that uses the rendered spec. Uh, the way RPM works, the spec file of the package you store in this git, uh, it can contain macros. The macros, um, they can be of two types. One type is uses an internal macro language of RPM that I'm pretty sure is Turing complete but you should not do that. The other type uses Lua, which is definitely Turing complete. Um, so you can do a lot of very exciting things with RPM macros that you probably should not unless you really know what you're doing. Um, so it's really useful to have a copy of the spec after all the madness happened so you can see what the end result is. Uh, that ends up in the spec tag, but obviously this isn't, this isn't super useful, super helpful when you're doing reproducible builds because say, if I'm doing a build on an S86 builder and a build on an ARM builder and the package isn't arched, the render spec might not be identical, but it might not be identical in ways that don't actually matter. Um, like for example, the macros that declare the architecture on the top will be different. Even if you don't care, there will be a difference. And while we could post-process the packages and throw these things away, they are actually kind of useful because, Michelle. Correct. Uh, no, this is also, uh, do we, do we have spec in binary RPMs too? You know, I don't remember. We definitely have build the host in binary RPMs. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, yeah. Um, Michelle was saying that the, the specific issue, the example I made was in particular about source RPM and that is true. Uh, but the, the general concept stays. Um, so you could strip these, but they are kind of useful because when you are trying to figure out, oh, why is this package sec faulting? It is useful to know, oh, it came from this builder and then go, oh, this builder was fucked. Okay, uh, that, that, that gives us good signal. Or, oh, the spec, uh, the spec had, a, had an issue and then we figure out where it came from. So we don't really want to throw this away. So again, we, add, we decided after discussing this with the RPM team, and if you're interested, you can read the issues. We, can, uh, we, just, we decided that we would keep these as they are. We wouldn't make Koji throw this away, but we would, uh, we would just add them to the list of things that RPM diff would ignore so that we don't have to worry about it when we're doing reproducible builds. Um, about source RPMs. So source RPMs are RPMs that are the same as the RPMs that you install on your machine, but they have the tarball of the sources. So the idea is that you take the source RPM, you feed it to your build tool of choice, and you get the binary RPMs out. Now the source RPMs 
are supposed to be architecture independent, but mm, ish. Uh, the source APMs are made on builders, and the builders make assumptions, and they'll do things like inject the architecture of the builder into the source RPM. Uh, the file names of the source RPM we discovered were the, the ownership of the files was the ownership of the user doing the build. Uh, that was actually a bug, and we fixed it. Uh, the arts thing is a feature. Uh, I personally believe it's a bug, but uh, people thought differently. Um, they thought that there was value in preserving that. Uh, people can disagree on this. Uh, and likewise, uh, because as I mentioned, spec files can be effectively Turing complete, you can do things like in your spec that are like, if I'm on ARM, add this package to your build dependencies. If I'm not on ARM, add this other package to your build dependencies. Um, you can also do things like, if I'm on ARM, include these extra files. Um, again, some of these things might make more sense than others, but they can all be sources of irreproducibility that then you have to deal with. And then, there, of course, there's timestamps. Timestamps are lovely. So um, RPM, the way RPMs work is like, I'm, like most of these uh, packaging formats work. You have like three passes where one pass is you prepare the sources and you unpack them. One pass is you build your thing. One pass is you install your thing. In the prep phase, it is not uncommon to have to do things like run sed because your auto tools um, build your mm, build definition that the package provides is broken and you need to fix something and you're too lazy to make a patch. So you'll just run sed to fix like the one line thing you need to fix. Uh, also, some packages will use uh, git style patches and the way git style patches work is that you make a bunch of git commits. You might be aware that git commits have timestamps in them. Um, so both of these are, effectively, you will end up having a bunch of files where the timestamp of the file depends on when you were doing the build, which is not ideal. Uh, the way we solve this in RPM is that we introduce the concept of source date epoch, where source date epoch is an environment variable that we set at build time. Uh, we set it to the date of the last changelog entry of the package. The changelog is what tells you what, what changed in the package, as you might be able to figure out from the name. So usually whenever you do something to a package, you add a line in the changelog that's like, edit option blah, and this has a timestamp. So by doing this, it becomes deterministic because whenever you build the package, wherever you build the package, all the timestamps are the same. Um, we fixed part of this in Fedora 38, and then we fixed the Git stuff um, literally two weeks ago because we only found out recently. Uh, it, would, it unfortunately will not make the cut for Fedora 40, but it will make the cut for Fedora 41 because uh, it will be in the next release of RPM. That, that pull request is already merged. Uh, oh, then, of course, that's bug. So I mentioned earlier um, non-deterministic serialization. If you use Python, you might be familiar with pickles. Uh, pickle is this lovely format that Python has that is a memory dump of the data structure of the object that you had. And uh, not only this is non-deterministic, but it is a wonderful source of all kind of weirdness, because if you, if you put random garbage in it, it is not at all hard to get it to Segfault. Um, you should not use this if you do Python. Um, Java is a similar thing, by the way, although luckily I haven't seen as much of that in the wild. Um, we did a um, survey because we, in Fedora, we have uh, all of the sources are indexed by uh, something called source graph. So it's very easy to search through all the package definitions. And we found that there were quite a few packages that built documentation using Sphinx that were including pickle files in, in the packages. And Obviously, you do not need this, and this turned out to be just a bug where because every package, uh, there's no standard for doing Sphinx docs, so every package does it slightly differently. We can't really have a macro to build the Sphinx docs in a good way, and people forget that, like, oh, you should really delete this pickle crap because we, we, it's not useful. Um, so I started cleaning this up. There's, like, 20 more packages that we have to fix. Um, the other source of bugs that I mentioned is uh, non-arch packages doing archful things. And the most common one by far is no arch packages installing things in lib64. Um, if you're no arch, you, you cannot install in lib64 because you don't know if lib64 exists. Because if you happen to be on ARM32, that's called lib, not lib64. Um, if you're not familiar, Fedora uh, does, uh, doesn't do multi-lib. Uh, so the, um, the lib directory, so user lib or lib, as a suffix that's architecture specific. So on 64-bit architectures like ARM64 or XAC64, that's called user lib64. On 32-bit, it's called user lib. Um, so that's not great. Um, we actually found genuine bugs in multiple packages that did this. 
Um, and some of these can be extremely confusing because the way the builds work for NoArch packages is that builds for NoArch packages happen on a random builder. So if today your build is on S390X, you get a 64-bit. If today your build is on i386, you get 32 bits. Lucky you. Um, I think we fixed a good number of these, but I'm pretty sure there's still a few. There's still a few there. Um, and then archives and archival formats in general can be exciting. Uh, Java jar files are especially bad because jar files embed build timestamps, but also the tool to extract jars looks up the local time zone and translates all of the timestamps to the local time zone in ways that you probably don't want. Um, yeah, this isn't great. Also, static archives uh, embed timestamps, but they also embed ownership, which you really don't want. Um, and because static archives come from GCCR, unless you want to like patch GCC or do horrible thing to your compiler suite, um, what we've decided that for both of these problems, the same solution is likely to have a post-processor that we run as part of the build process. Um, this is easy with RPM because we already have a bunch of post-processors in RPM where, so for example, if you package, uh, if you package a shell script or something with a shebang, there's a post-processor that will look up all of the shebangs and make sure they point to the right place. So if you have a shebang that's like bin sh, it will uh, repoint it to use a bin sh uh, and things like that. So it's, it's, it's a straightforward way to do this. Um, the other thing that we, we will do where we haven't already is file bugs upstream for all of these projects, but I, I don't have like super high hopes of getting like jar files fixed in like a timely, uh, in, in, in a timely avenue. So, um, oh yeah, I forgot about this one. Uh, I mentioned the PyYC earlier. Uh, PyYCs are functionally equivalent but not identical. So if you run your Python script on S390 and on x86, the PyYC will work the same and theoretically you can move them around, but they're not identical. Uh, this is unc it's unclear whether this is a bug or not, but it's definitely something that is annoying. Uh, in Fedora, we'll fix this via post-processing because we already do a lot of post-processing for Python anyway. Um, uh, Golang uh, also has uh, fun stuff where the, the, debugging, the debugging for the detached, the detached debug symbols for the Golang packages they have sections that aren't deterministic. We don't know why, um, and we need to look into this. Uh, this is, I'm fairly sure this is a bug, but it may turn out to be something weirder. So where are we? Um, so we have a tool that can do distro-wide rebuilds of um, everything in Fedora in Mock. Mock is the tool that we use to do isolated builds. So what this tool does is that it fetches the builds from Koji, it does it locally, it checks with RPM diff. If they're good, they're good. If they're bad, it feeds them to Diffoscope and it writes up a report. Um, thanks to this process, we've already found a lot of issues, the ones I mentioned here and many more, and we started documenting them and fixing them. And we have documentation so that people can understand what we are doing and ideally help. Uh, we have 55% of the distribution is reproducible right now, 55% by source, 78% by binary packages. Um, like many distributions, the, the mapping is one to many, so one source package can do many binary packages. And if you have, say, a Python package, the doc package, if it has the pickle thing, that's not gonna be reproducible, but the other ones will be. So that's why the numbers are interesting. Um, if you go to that very long URL that you will get when I upload the slides in a minute, uh, you can see the summary right now. This is not super friendly, I would say. It's a text file that we, it's mostly something meant for us to start making progress. Uh, once the tooling is um, a bit more mature, what we will try to do is get it um, hooked up with the CI that reproducibles.org makes available, which gives us really pretty dashboards, and it makes it very easy to see where things are at. Um, the other thing we're looking at doing is re-implementing strip non-determinism in Rust. Strip non-determinism is great, but it's written in Perl. And uh, this is not a problem for Debian, because a lot of the tools that Debian uses are written in Perl. It is a problem for Fedora because none of the tools we use are written in Perl and people, turns out, are not extremely keen on adding a build dependency on Perl to the entire distribution. So uh, we already have an initial re-implementation of this in Rust. Uh, they, uh, right now it only does uh, .a static archives, but we're hoping to add coverage for the other things we mentioned here and potentially contribute this to the wider project. Um, and yeah, fixing more issues, of course. So how can you help? Uh, you can file bugs. Bugs are always 
appreciate it. You can also help write the documentation, which right now is very bare bones. Um, there are a lot of discussions upstream happening. Um, there are different, uh, this presentation talks primarily about the point of view of Fedora. Fedora isn't the only RPM-based distribution, and other RPM-based distributions like OpenSUSE have different requirements and different interests and look at this from different points of view. Uh, so I think it's extremely valuable if you are part of the RPM ecosystem to participate in these discussions so that the folks upstream are aware of your requirements and your needs and they can be considered. Um, what I suspect is going to be the outcome of some of this discussion is that we will try to get a number of knobs in RPM so that you can choose what kind of level of reproducibility you need and whether you're okay with losing losing some debuggability and trading that for reproducibility or vice versa. So everybody can kind of find their sweet spot. Uh, we have a matrix room that you are welcome to join that we use for coordinating this work. We will also be at uh, DEFCOM CZ in Brno and at FLOC in Brno, Czech Republic, and at FLOC in uh, Rochester um, in New York State later this year. Um, you are welcome to come and say hi to us. I'm around for the next couple of hours before I have to disappear on a plane. Uh, and I will happily answer any questions. Is there, <clears throat> is there any work going on in CentOS Stream? Because I know you're kind of... No, that but that is an excellent question. Um, uh, I would like work there to be in CentOS Stream as well. I think it's a bit premature to do this in Stream because I think 95% of the work we do in Fedora will end up being useful for Stream. And it, not only the work we do in Fedora will naturally help Stream, but also the tooling will be the same. So I think developing the tooling in Fedora makes the most sense. But one thing I would love to see is once this is more mature, um, both seeing this happen in stream and seeing this happen in the RHEL rebuild community, like it would be fantastic to see rebuilders do their own rebuilds and prove that the builds are reproducible because I think that would add a lot of value and would make a lot more classes of bugs to be easy to spot. Is there any Apple registration? Uh, Fedora includes Apple, so yes, uh, you will get Apple effectively for free. We are not doing Apple right now, we were only doing Fedora, 40, Fedora Rawhide effectively, uh, but I, I think we will do Apple immediately once that's available because that's just free. Yes? Uh, how, how many people are working on uh, the reproducibility within Fedora? Um, one and a half, I would say, and I'm the half. Uh, uh, okay. No, like in, in, all, in all seriousness, there's maybe a dozen people in the room that are interested, that are like, participating in conversation and offering feedback, the actual work that I talked about has been primarily done by one person, uh, who is Bishek, who is not here. Wow, yeah, it just seems like there's a lot to do. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yes. <laughs> Would you like to help? <laughs> uh, maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure this it will take a while, and like that's expected. So does this tie in at all to Say Silverblue? Um, it doesn't, uh, but it, it helps Silverblue in the sense that the, the source of the packages for Silverblue is the same as Fedora. So any all of this work happening in Fedora, uh, classic for lack of a better name, uh, will also help Silverblue and the immutable variants uh, of Fedora. Um, I don't know if there are classes of issues that are I don't know if there are artifacts that Silverblue produces that are more or less reproducible that, than the ones for non-immutable distribution. That would be interesting to look at. I don't know. You talked about geometry. Uh, you mentioned that you would rather do post-processing than, say, changing GCCAR to remove uh, artifacts. Um, is that something, is, is that a, a, just a matter of trying to work with GCC or just GCC? Um, GCC, or is it that it is truly that much simpler to just post-process post everything? So, there's, there's a few angles to this. For the specific case of GCC, it's a bit tricky because it's not just GCC, because we have two, in Fedora we have both a GCC-based toolchain and LLVM-based toolchain. Uh, so getting this fixed properly at the source is a meaningful amount of work. It's work that should happen, and we will at the very least file bugs to ensure it's tracked. 
Um, but we would also like to be able to make measurable progress on this in the near term. So we believe that post-processing is a reasonable approach for things that aren't bugs. Because at the end of the day, embedding timestamps is unpleasant, but it's not a, it's not a bug. It's, it doesn't damage the users. So I don't think it makes sense to block the project on that. But absolutely, I, what I don't want to do is introduce a bunch of workarounds for stuff that we could fix at the source. So we, we should definitely follow up on that. Any other questions? Uh, the, the soft type of uh, clamping, uh, does it mean that if you... I think you're on. Okay. Yeah, you have to yeah. eat the microphone. Oh. Um, the soft clamping, does it mean that if you are um, modifying a file, like in prep, do you no longer need uh, a lot of um, old packages have this thing where they take the timestamp to touch. And Correct, yeah, you don't need to do the dance anymore. But you still do if you are targeting, uh, if you are using the spec in Apple or something, right? Uh, you still need to do it uh, if you are before F38, because that's shipped in F38. Um, uh, for wider context, if you're not super familiar with Fedora, it is fairly common uh, to, when you're doing things like touching a file, it is fairly common to do a dance where you touch to a stable, you touch an empty file to a stable timestamp, and then you move it to ensure that the timestamp stays the same. Um, if you if you remember that this is a thing that you should probably do, uh, now that we clamp the M time to the change log, you don't need to do this anymore. But because that change landed in Fedora 38, anything that's before Fedora 38, you still need to do that, uh, unless we backport that thing in RPM, which I doubt we will. Um, so uh, yes, you probably still need to do it. Uh, it's gonna be like those things, and definitely Appel, uh, Appel 9 and earlier, you will still need that. Appel 10 will be fine, because 10 will come off 40. <laughs> that is it for questions, and thank you very much, Davide. Thank you. And thank you all for coming to the reproducibility immutable track.